So that is, our probability of having any particular base is going to be the same as having any other particular base. There is no preference for the organism surviving or not surviving, depending on what the allele value of that particular base is. And some of these assumptions we'll see later how we can relax those and look at more complicated scenarios, but we'll just begin with uh, this assumption. So if we want to study evolution of a single base then, we would typically model this as a kind of Markov process. We would generally assume that the base in the next generation depends only on the base in the previous generation. So if this is a T in this generation, then what it is here doesn't depend on the fact that it was an A here or here. And that is essentially the assumption we generally have with the Markov model, and it suggests that we can look at evolution of a particular base like this by modeling it as a Markov process. So assuming that we have a set of base values, let's say A, G, C, T, and we have some process that describes over successive generations how these base values mutate. For the moment, we're going to start with a simple version of this process in which we're going to assume that there is some probability the base remains the same in the next generation, and then an equal probability of it moving to any other value. So we can say that maybe there's a probability P of each change here, and that would give us a self-transition probability of 1 minus 3P, and then we would say that that's symmetric in this model, so it's going to be the same both directions for all of these edges. And so this gives us a starting point where we can start to think about how a single base of DNA would evolve over successive generations as the walk through the Markov model, the Markov chain it generates, gives us a representation of this process. So this is known as a one-parameter model, or known by another name that I've heard some of you talking about before class, so I assume Dr. Durand is covering this now. Does anyone know what this is called? Yes, this is a Jukes cantor model. And this is in particular a discrete Jukes cantor model, so you can represent this as a discrete or a continuous process, but let's start by representing it as a discrete process. So once we have a model like this, we've specified what the Markov model of the system is. In the generic case, a Markov model would have a state set. What's our state set here? The yes, our states are A, C, G, or T. And we would have some initial probability vector. For our purposes here, we might say that maybe we're starting with a particular base of and your initial probability vector is 1, 0, 0, 0, which means we start with an A. Could be equal probability of each, doesn't matter too much. And we have a transition matrix, which is just the thing specified by the edges here. We've got a 1 minus 3P on each of the diagonal elements. And then we've got P for each of the non-diagonal elements. So this would be our Markov model representation of the system that we're interested in. And once we recognize that, we can start to use this representation to ask questions about how this model would behave using some of the theory we've covered before. So one of the things we would often be interested in is the stationary distribution, which we would represent as pi for this model. Can anyone tell me what the stationary distribution would be? So it would have to be one fourth in each direction. Can anyone give me a proof of that? How would we know that that's the stationary distribution? There are a few different ways we could answer that. One kind of roundabout way to do it would be that we could show that this model exhibits detailed balance. We could do that by recognizing that any cycle in the model of length k has probability p to the k of traversing in either direction. So this model must exhibit detailed balance. And then the ratio of the edge probabilities along any edge in the two directions would tell us the ratio of the stationary probabilities of the two states. And since these ratios of edge or transition probabilities are one for every edge, 
B ratio of probabilities of the states has to be one for any pair of connected states, which tells us they all have to be the same, so they all have to be one fourth. There's another way we could at least verify that this is the stationary probability vector. Can anyone tell me what that is? It would so use it's, the, what's that? Is this the eigenvector of the matrix P? Yes. yes. Because it's uh, not full rank, so it has a eigenvalue zero, and then, um, so it's um, in the null space of the matrix P. Uh, well, for the discrete version, it wouldn't be in the, the null space. It would be, so if we try multiplying P times pi, what we're going to end up with is we've got one fourth times each of these, so it's one minus three p plus p plus p plus p. Or in other words, these will cancel out. We get one fourth, and likewise, we would get one fourth for each of the other elements. So, what's the eigenvalue? Yeah. So the eigenvalue. Say, well, this lambda 1 is equal to 1. So in a discrete Markov model, the stationary vector is always going to be an eigenvector with eigenvalue 1, and we can verify that this is the only eigenvector that has eigenvalue 1 for this particular matrix. There are, of course, going to be other eigenvectors for this matrix, and those ones would be a little harder to derive. I'm not going to go through how you would derive them, but I'll tell you what they are, and we can look at some of the properties of these. So one of these, let's call this x2, would be the following. It would be 1 half minus 1 half, 0, 0. And can anyone figure out what the eigenvalue corresponding to that would be? we do the multiplication p times this vector, what we're going to get is that p times x2 is going to be 1 half times 1 minus 3p plus p. So that's going to give us 1 minus 3p, excuse me, minus 1 half 0, so minus p over 2. In the next row, we're going to get 1 half times p plus minus 1 half times 1 minus 3p. So we're going to get minus 1 plus 3p plus p over 2. And then the next two rows, we get 1 half times p plus minus 1 half times p. So these ones will be 0. And if we walk through what the math gives us there, what that's going to end up giving us is 1 minus 4p over 2, 1 minus 4p over 2, 0, 0. So what does that make lambda 2? make lambda 2, 1 minus 4p. So this is simply this times 1 minus 4p. Does that make sense to everyone? OK, so we would also have an x3, so another eigenvector, and that one is going to look like 1 fourth, 1 fourth, minus 1 half, 0. And this one, if we work through the math, we could again multiply p times this eigenvector, and we're going to get out the eigenvalue lambda 3 is actually also 1 minus 4p. And there's also going to be an x4, and x4 is going to look like 1 6, 1 6, 1 6, minus 1 half. And if we did the math again, we would find out that this one also has eigenvalue 1 minus 4p. So that would give us the complete uh, eigenvalue and eigenvector set for the matrix P. Any questions about that? Okay, so once we've derived that, what we end up with is something we can use to study in, in some detail how this model would behave as a function of time. So if we start from some initial vector, like 1, 0, 0, 0, what would the probability distribution of base values look like at arbitrary steps after that point in time? 
And we can use an eigen decomposition to do that, as we've seen before, by recognizing that if we can decompose the starting vector 1, 0, 0, 0 into a linear combination of the eigenvectors, then each of the eigenvectors is going to have a contribution that decays geometrically with its corresponding eigenvalue. So in other words, what we can say is that after k steps of evaluation of the model, which we would get by, multiply, by taking p to the kth power, multiplied by our initial vector, which I'm assuming at the moment is 1, 0, 0, 0, what we would end up with is a decomposition of 1, 0, 0, 0, or 1, 0, 0, 0 into the eigenvectors, and that would be multiplied by the eigenvalues to the k. So in other words, we would have some coefficient c1 times first eigenvalue to the k times first eigenvector, one-fourth, 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 plus a c2 times the second eigenvalue, one minus four p to the k times second eigenvector, one-half minus one-half, zero, zero. C3, 1 minus 4p to the k times the third eigenvector, 1 fourth, 1 fourth, minus 1 half, 0. And finally, C4, 1 minus 4p to the k times the last eigenvector, 1 6, 1 6, 1 6, minus 1 half. So this would immediately tell us, even before we figure out what the C's are, roughly what the behavior of this model would be. We have one term that isn't going to die away with k, so that would tell us that this is the limit to which it goes in long enough k. And we also know that since each of these other terms have the same coefficient to them, that the transients are going to decay, in particular, geometrically with this rate 1 minus 4p. So in each successive round, we're going to get something that looks sort of like the following. And we can say the probability that, let's say, this base still has the value A would start out at 1 at step 0 of the model, and then it would decay with this kind of geometric progression, eventually approaching 1 fourth. So does that make sense to everyone? All right, so if we wanted a bit more detail of what this would look like, of course, we'd want to know what the values of the C's are. Can anyone tell me how we would figure that out? Well, we basically already have posed the problem we need to solve here. If we, let's just say we make k equal to zero, then what we've got here is a linear system we want to solve. 1, 0, 0, 0 equals c1 times 1 fourth, 1 fourth, 1 fourth, 1 fourth, plus c2 times 1 half minus 1 half, 0, 0, etc. So we could write down the set of linear equations corresponding to that. So we have 1 equals 1 fourth c1 plus 1 half c2 plus 1 fourth c3 plus 1 sixth. A second equation would be 0 equals 1 fourth c1 minus 1 half c2 plus 1 fourth c3 plus 1 sixth c4. And if we kept going, we'd have a 0 equals 1 fourth c1 plus 0 c2 minus 1 half c3 plus 1 sixth c4. And finally, 0 equals 1 fourth c1 plus 0 c2 plus 0 c3 minus 1 half c4. So how would we solve something like this? Inequality? Uh, yes, it, well, in this case, we, we, could, we could keep it as equality, so you don't need to think of it as inequalities, but we have a system here that we should uh, have some tools for solving. Yeah, it's simplex method? Well, well, the simplex method is a bit more complicated than we need. So we, we have equalities rather than inequalities here. And all, all this is is a, a linear system. So 
basically what we would do is we could say that we've got um, fourth, one fourth, one half, one half, or minus one half, zero, zero, and so forth, times an unknown vector, C1, C2, C3, C4, equals a known vector, one, zero, zero, zero. That's a linear algebra problem. We just solve a linear system. So you could use Gaussian elimination or a, you know, a Krilov subspace method or whatever. But basically, we have tools to solve that. I'm not going to walk through you know, how we would run Gaussian elimination on it. But if we do that, we would eventually get out an answer that C1 equals 1, C2 equals 1, C3 equals 2 thirds, and C4 equals 1 half. You could plug that in there and get an exact description of the probability distribution as a function of time for the A base as well as for all of the others. In this case, we can kind of figure out that all of the others have to look something like this. They have to start at zero. They would grow at the same rate that uh, A decays, so they would approach the same limit, and they would all end up in approaching the stationary distribution one-fourth of each uh, possible base. Does that make sense to our friend? Okay, so that gives us a way of understanding how a system like this would behave. But very often with these kinds of molecular evolution models, you don't really want to think of them in terms of discrete generations. So if we were really looking at a model like this, so you were looking at, let's say, actual rates of mutation in a bacterium, you might have that P is maybe 10 to the minus 9th, and you might be interested in looking at you know, thousands of generations. You might want k is 10,000 or something like that. If you're looking at longer time scales of evolution, you might want something more like you know, k is, uh, could be for a larger organism, could be a million generations, could be maybe even much longer than that. But basically, the point of this is that we generally are not going to want to run this model for as many generations as you actually want to simulate. And that motivates a different view of looking at this, which is a continuous extension of this model. So um, basically a simplification where we assume that the probability of mutation is so small on each generation that we can approximately say that it behaves as an exponential rather than geometric process. So we can say if you're in some base A, then instead of having a probability of change, we would say you would have a rate of change lambda, and we could say that that rate of change of lambda would apply to any of the other possible bases, GCT, and likewise we'd have continuous rates in the opposite direction. We can more or less think of lambda as kind of a limit in the limit of a very small amount of time, a uh, very small probability of mutating on any given generation times a very large number of generations, and that would give us an overall rate of mutation. So roughly speaking, what this is motivating is that we can also describe this kind of process approximately as a continuous time Markov model. So thinking of these transitions as exponential time rates rather than of discrete generations. All right, so let's say we instead represent this as a continuous time Markov model, and that's kind of implicitly making the assumption that we are looking at a very large number of generations with a very small probability of mutation per generation. Then how would we analyze the behavior of a system like this? If we wanted to do the equivalent of what we had done with the eigenvalues and eigenvectors here and find a characterization of the complete probability distribution that we're still in state A, given that we started in state A at any arbitrary time t in the future. How would we do that? Well, the main tool we have for that is the Kolmogorov equations. So with the Kolmogorov equations, what we would want to do is formally state what our rate matrix is. We'll have some transition rates that we will call lambda. If we're sticking with the jukes cantor model, then we would say that all of the off-diagonal elements will be lambda. So 
than what would go on the diagonal. How do we define the self-transition rate in a Kolmogorov matrix? Well, we would effectively pretend that we, we have a self-transition rate that's simply minus the sum of the outgoing rates for that state. So we have three edges coming out of the A state. They each have rate lambda, so we would assume a rate of minus three lambda for the self-transition, and that would be the same for each of these. And then that's what would go on the diagonal here. And that would give us a characterization of this system as a continuous time Markov model. And we can then use the Kolmogorov equations to try to characterize what the complete behavior as a function of time of this model would be. So if we wanted to do that, we could derive a set of Kolmogorov equations of the form, let's say, dp aa dt, dp ac dt, and so forth, dp ag dt, and dp at dt, which would characterize the behavior of this probability function, where PAA of t is the probability we're still in state A at time t, given that we're in state A at time zero. PAC is the probability we're in state C at time t, given that we were in state A at time zero, and so forth. And how would we derive, let's say, the PAA Kolmogorov equation? There would be one term of the form the PAA dt is equal to something times PAA. So what would we multiply that by? The way we would think of this is that we're saying that the instantaneous rate of change of the probability of being in A given that we started in A, we could derive by asking the probability we're in A, given that we started in A, times the instantaneous rate of movement from A to A, which is just lambda AA. So it's minus three lambda, that would be the transition probability for A to A. And we could likewise say that there is a probability PAC, and we would multiply that by the probability of then transitioning, or the rate of change from C back to A, which is lambda. And likewise, there's a PAG, and that would also have a coefficient lambda, that would be the rate of change from G back to A, and probability we move from A to T times the rate of movement from T back to A. So that would give us the first of our Kolmogorov equations. And we could simplify that a bit and say that's minus 3 lambda PAA plus lambda times PAC plus PAG plus PAT. Now in this case, we can actually simplify even a little more. So we can recognize that PAC plus PAG plus PAT is related to PAA. And how are those related? So we've now derived that dPAA dt is equal to minus 4 lambda PAA plus lambda. And we should recognize that this is in a form we know how to solve. It's a special case of the form dy dt equals ay plus b. 
And as we saw a couple of classes ago, or actually I guess last class, this is solved in the general case by y equals c e to the a t minus d over a. And if we plug that in here, what we would get is that p a a of t must be equal to c e to the a t. So a here is minus 4 lambda, so c e to the minus 4 lambda t plus b over a which is lambda over 4 lambda, or 1 fourth. How would we solve for C then? It's going to depend on the initial conditions. So what would the initial conditions of PAA of T would be? Ask it another way, what's PAA of zero? A quarter. What's that? Uh, a quarter. Well, well, if we're, PAA is defined as the probability we're in state A at time t, given that we started in state A at time zero. One. Yeah, it has to be one. So if no time has elapsed, it has to still be in state A. So we know PAA of zero equals one which is equivalent to saying that c e to the 0, which is just 1, plus 1 fourth, is equal to 1, or c is equal to 3 fourths. So we would know in the general case, then, p a of t is 3 fourths c to the minus 4 lambda t plus 1 fourth. Does that make sense to everyone? OK, so we could follow the same kind of logic to solve for the other equations, and I think it might be worth running through one more. In this case, because of the symmetry of the system, we could actually avoid solving the others, but it's worth seeing one more example, I think. Let's take dPAT dt. That's going to have some term with the coefficient PAA. What would be the coefficient of PAA? Well, we're, we're saying that the rate of transition from A to T is equal to the probability we're in A times the rate of the instantaneous rate of transition from A to T, which is this lambda. And we have similarly a lambda PAC term plus a lambda PAG term. And then we would have one special term, which is going to be the probability we're in state t times the rate of transition from t to t, which we've said is virtually minus 3 lambda. And if we put all of this together, what we're going to end up with is that lambda times PAA plus PAC plus PAG, which is just 1 minus PAT, minus 3 lambda PAT, is going to be equal to this. And we can simplify that to say that this is minus 3 lambda PAT plus lambda, which we can observe is actually the same form we had here. It's basically giving us the same equation. So we know it's going to have the same solution. P A T to T is going to be C e to the minus 4 lambda T plus 1 fourth. And how would we solve for C? Well, just as before, we'll want to use the initial conditions. So we'll want to use P A T of 0 to solve for C. So what's P A T of 0? Yeah, it's zero. It's had no time to move from A to T. So that's equal to zero. And that's equal to C e to the zero, which is just C plus one fourth. In other words, C has to be minus one fourth. So that then tells us that the solution of P A T of T is minus one fourth e to the minus four lambda T plus one fourth. And if we try to plot how those two solutions look, what we're going to end up with is that we know in the limit 
as the exponential term decays away, they're going to go to one fourth. The PAA term is going to start at one, and it's going to decay with a rate of this thing minus four lambda towards one fourth. And the PAT term is going to start at zero and grow with the same exponential rate, also converging on one fourth. So that's going to be PAT. And by the symmetry of the system, we know it would be the same if we had picked PAC or PAG. And you might notice that this is very similar to the plot we had in the discrete case. It's basically just taking the limit of kind of smoothing out the bumps and the geometric decay in the discrete model, so that limit becomes an exponential and we get the continuous uh, Jukes Cantor model. Does that make sense to everyone? Okay, any questions about this before we move on? Okay, well, sometimes we're going to want a more complex model than this, or a more realistic model. And a uh, typical way that's done is to try to relax the assumption that all of our rates of mutation or probabilities of mutation are equal. And the simplest way to do that is to recognize that certain kinds of mutations are more common than others. In particular, it ends up being more frequent that A's mutate to G's and vice versa than A's mutate to T's or C's or G's mutate to T's or C's, which inspires a two-parameter version of the model where we would assume you have a fast probability or high probability of mutation, P1, of moving A to T or, or A to G or T to C or vice versa and slow probability for all of the other directions, so P2 of moving in any other direction. And what would that then make our self-transition probabilities? one minus the sum of the outgoing probabilities, so one minus P1 minus two P2. And that's going to be the same for all of them. All right, so does anyone know what this model is called? Yeah, so that's a Kimura model. the Kimura model very much the same way we analyze the Jukes Cantor model. So we could say there is a discrete transition matrix P. We've specified here what all of the terms of that are. If we write this, I'm going to write it in the order, A, G, C, T, just to make things a little cleaner. Then we would have these two submatrices that have fast transitions. So P1, P1, and here we have P1. P1, we would have slow transitions between the submatrices, so P2, 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 and so forth. And then we would have our self-transition probabilities on the diagonals, so 1 minus P1 minus 2, P2, and so forth. And if we were really interested in it, we could apply the same kind of eigenvalue analysis that we applied in the Jukes Cantor case. We could derive the eigenvalues and eigenvectors. We could decompose any starting state into linear combination of the eigenvectors. And then we could use that to study the um, evolution of the model as a function of discrete steps. So I'm going to skip going through that for this model since we, it's not really that different what we've seen in the Jukes Cantor model. But as with the Jukes Cantor, we could also jump ahead and use a continuous version of this, which would be more often what would be realistic for typical values, or at least tractable for typical values or mutation rates. And we could convert this to a continuous version of the model, where we would assume we would have a fast rate of transition, lambda 1, 
minus lambda 1, or excuse me, lambda 1, lambda 1, between, a, between C and T, and slow rates of lambda 2 for all the other transitions. I'm not going to bother writing all of them. And what would that make the effective self-transition rates for the continuous matrix be? Well, we just add up the outgoing rates for each element, and then it would be minus that, so minus lambda 1, minus 2, lambda 2. And so just as with the jukes cantor model, if we then wanted to take this continuous version, so continuous time Markov model representation of the system, we could write the Kolmogorov equations for that. So we could come up with, let's say, dPAA dt, just as we did in the jukes cantor case. And what would that look like? And then you would tell me what we would have as the equation for dPAA dt. Well, we would have a PAA term and a PAC and a PAG. It's a PAG, a PAC, and a PAT term. So what would be the coefficient of PAA? Minus lambda one minus Yeah, so minus lambda one minus lambda two. So it's the probability we've moved from A to A times the rate of transition from A to A. And what would be, what's that? Oh, oh yeah, two lambda two. And what would the coefficient of the PAG term be? Lambda one lambda one. Yeah, so we move from A to G and we want the rate of movement from G back to A. So that's lambda one. And what about PAC and PAT terms? Yes, it's both lambda two. Right, and we could do the same thing with each of the other equations. I'm not going to go through all of them, but maybe I'll do one more. So if we had PAG dt, then we would have a rate of trend, we would have a PAA term with a rate of transition from A to G, which is lambda 1, plus a PAG term with the self-transition rate for G, which is minus lambda 1, minus 2 lambda 2, plus a PAC term with the rate of transition from C to G, plus a PAT term, the rate of transition from T to G. And that would give us another Kolmogorov equation. We could go through the other ones, and again, I'm not going to bother writing all of them. But this would define a transition matrix. You can get this matrix lambda that describes this uh, linear system here. And if we wrote down all the elements of this, we'd get minus 2 lambda 1, or minus lambda 1, minus 2 lambda 2, lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 2, and so forth. It would look very similar to the transition matrix we had in the discrete case. We just got lambdas, and we're effectively subtracting an identity matrix from it. So other than that, it's substituting lambdas for keys. And if we wanted to understand the evolution of this system with time, we could do a similar kind of eigenvalue analysis that we've seen before. This one doesn't have such a simple solution because we can't easily reduce it into a single variable and solve the single variable equation. But if we analyze the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of this system, we could come up with general solutions for the behavior of the system as a function of time. So just as in the discrete case, what we would end up with is that we would have some starting probability vector. So let's say we just assume we start in the A position. We would want to decompose this into a collection of eigenvectors, so we find the linear coefficients, such that this can be explained as a linear combination of the eigenvectors. And then the corresponding eigenvalues would tell us how this system uh, decays as a function of time. So in particular, with this system, I'm not going to go through how you would derive the eigenvalues and eigenvectors. 
but we would get some eigenvector x1 that I'm going to tell you has an eigenvalue, let's call it v, so we're not confusing the lambdas, v1 equals zero, and x1 is actually going to end up being the stationary transition probability of this matrix. So with these continuous time Markov models, instead of having a stationary probability vector with eigenvalue one, you get one with eigenvalue zero. It's a way of saying that basically the rate of change of each of the values is zero when you're, you're at the stationary vector. And in this case, the stationary vector is going to come out to one fourth, one fourth, one fourth, one fourth. So in that case, it's, it's kind of obvious from the symmetry of the matrix that it has to come out that way, but that's going to give us one of these, and the other ones are not so obvious. We're going to end up with an eigenvector x2, which is going to be similar to what we saw in the discrete uh, jukes cantor model. We'll have a 1 half minus 1 half 0, 0. We're going to have an x3, which is equal to 0, 0 one half minus one half, and we're going to have an x4, which is equal to one fourth, one fourth, minus one fourth, minus one fourth. And we could go through the exercise and figure out what all the corresponding eigenvalues are. So we could say that we have this matrix, you multiply it by one half minus one half, zero, zero. We work through that exercise, what we're going to end up figuring out is that this has an eigenvalue of minus two, lambda one plus lambda two. This one has an eigenvalue of also minus two, lambda one plus lambda two. You can kind of tell that from the fact that they're symmetric. And this one has an eigenvalue of minus four, lambda two. So these then would each basically be describing some mode of relaxation of the system towards the stationary state. So this term is going to give us in each of our equations something of the form C1, one fourth, one fourth, one fourth, one fourth, e to the zero t. So that will give us a, a, the stationary state to which it converges. These two are each going to give us something that looks like C2, one half minus one half, zero, zero, e to the minus two, lambda one plus lambda two t, and C3, zero, zero, one half minus one half, e to the minus two, lambda one plus lambda two t, and finally, one fourth, one fourth, minus one fourth, minus one fourth, C4, e to the minus four, lambda two, t. So those are going to be the general forms of the solution. And just as we've seen previously, if you have any particular starting vector, so any particular distribution, and you want to know how it evolves versus time, you would pose the linear system, solve for your coefficients, and then you have a complete description as a function of time of how the system decays. Does that make sense to everyone? Yeah. How is the exponent coming in here? Um, Last time we used uh, uh, p to the k. Uh, yeah, so if you're looking at a discrete Markov model, then you would get a, a effectively a p to the k term. In the continuous version of this, you would get an e to the lambda t term. So that would be the, the continuous extension of that in the limit of infinitely short time per generation, effectively, times infinitesimal uh, of probability of mutation per generation. Right, so this gives us a way of solving our system in the general case, and I'm not going to go through all of the possible answers we can get out of this, but I think it's worth looking at let's say one particular solution. So if we take the initial probability vector we've been looking at before, so in other words, assume it starts in a, as an A base, 
if we wanted to solve this, we could set up the linear system to solve it. So we would get C1 times 1 fourth plus C2 times 1 half plus C3 times 0 plus C4 times 1 fourth equals 1. C1 times 1 fourth plus C2 times minus 1 half plus C3 times 0 plus C4 times 1 fourth equals 0 and so forth. And solve those, what we're going to end up with is the following. We would get PAA is equal to 1 fourth e to the 0 t, or in other words, just 1 fourth plus 1 fourth e to the minus 4 lambda 2 t plus 1 half e to the minus 2 lambda 1 plus lambda 2 t. We would get PAG is equal to 1 fourth plus 1 fourth e to the minus 4 lambda 2 t minus 1 half e to the minus 2 lambda 1 plus lambda 2t. And we would get PAC is equal to PAT is equal to 1 fourth minus 1 fourth e to the minus 4 lambda 2t. And if we try to plot what these look like, we can see that it kind of makes sense in terms of how good the system should behave. We're assuming here that lambda 1 is a fast rate, so lambda 1 is a big value, and lambda 2 is a, a relatively slower rate, so that would be a small value. So in general, this term is going to be a faster rate of decay than this term. And so we would get a quick equilibration effectively between A and G. So we would say, if we looked at PAA, that would start at a value of 1 and it would equilibrate with G on this fast time scale until this term went away, at which point PAA would be effectively 1 fourth plus 1 fourth, because we're assuming this hasn't decayed much. So in other words, on a fast time scale, this goes to 1 half. And on the same time scale, PAG, we are assuming, would have this term decay away, this one not have decayed much, so this is also going to go to one half. And then we'll have a slower time scale described by this term over which gradually these three terms here will decay and they're all going to converge on one fourth. So on a slower time scale, eventually we're going to have PAC and PAT come up to one fourth and these two curves decay to one fourth of it on roughly the same time scale. So more or less the time scale of this process is 2 lambda 1 plus lambda 2. Or the rate of the process, the time scale would be about 1 over that. And then on a time scale of roughly 1 over 4 lambda 2, we would decay uh, in, so they all approach 1. Does that make sense to our friends? So what happens if lambda 1 equals lambda 2? Yeah, we should just get back the Jukes Cantor model. We can verify that's exactly what happens. So if lambda 1 and lambda 2 were both equal to lambda, this would become 2 lambda plus lambda, or 4 lambda. So you just add these two terms together, they'd both be 4 lambda. And likewise, here we would add these two terms together. Basically what we're going to end up getting back is exactly the solutions we got to the Jukes Cantor model. So any questions about any of that? Okay, so that gives us some basic tools we can use to analyze some simple models of mutation of one DNA base. But as I mentioned, we really want to get to more complicated kinds of scenarios. So the next step would be to say, now that we have an idea how we would analyze evolution of one base, let's move to analyzing evolution of a whole strand of DNA over a single lineage of evolution. So looking at n bases instead of one base, you know, as we transition through a process like this. So if we're using one of these continuous mutation models, then we can say that for any particular base, 
the time that elapses between mutations is going to be exponentially distributed with some rate lambda. What lambda is depends on which of the models we're using. So if we were using the Jukes Cantor, then this lambda would really be three times the lambda that we had for the basic Jukes Cantor. But in, in any case, for any one base, we can say the distribution of times until its next mutation is exponential with some rate lambda. So, ever had thought of that? So what then would be the distribution of times until any of the n bases mutates? How would we describe that? So over the whole strand, what that is, what is the time until the next mutation of any base in the strand? Assuming we have uh, n bases here. Well, it's equivalent to saying that we're asking for the minimum of a set of independent exponential lambdas. And what is the distribution of the minimum of a set of uh, independent exponential random variables? How do you derive that? It's also exponential. Yeah, it's also exponential, and we get the rate by adding up the rates of the individual processes. So, in other words, the time until we have any mutation in any of the bases is exponential with rate n lambda. So that would give us a way of creating a simulation of mutation in the entire strand. We can just basically run through a loop where we sample an exponential n lambda random variable, pick a base uniformly at random, flip that base, sample another one, tells us how much time elapses until the next mutation, pick a base uniformly at random and flip it, and just keep doing that over and over. So that would give us one way of simulating this kind of process. But very often we'll want something a little more efficient than that. And it turns out that we can use some probability theory to get a little better than that. Because often what we'll want to do is be able to take an entire length of time, so let's say t units of time, and ask how many mutations have accumulated in t units of time. So if we have an exponential process with rate n lambda, and we watch that process for a time t, the number of times this occurs within that unit of time we're looking at, within that amount of time, is itself a random variable. So in this case, it's in particular a kind of discrete random variable. And that's a random variable you may also have heard about called a Poisson random variable. So if you're watching an exponential process for a finite amount of time, and we're assuming that every time the exponential occurs, we sample another one to get the next time, sample another one to get the next time, then the number of times that process completes in a fixed amount of time is Poisson. And in particular, it would be Poisson with a rate of the rate of the exponential times the amount of time we watch it. So Poisson random variable, for those who haven't seen it before, has the probability density that the probability of Poisson of some rate lambda is equal to k is given by lambda to the k over k factorial e to the minus lambda. So this is a discrete random variable defined for any non-negative k. And that's going to tell us how many mutations we get in a particular span of time here. So often what we really want to do in a system like this is say, we're interested in the mutation process over t units of time. We sample our Poisson random variable to see how many mutations there are. And then when we get that k mutations, then we pick uniformly at random k bases and mutate those k bases. Does that make sense to everyone? So there's one more extension to this that we generally do with a system like this that can make it a, a little easier to analyze and a little more practical for a, a lot of the, the cases we're interested in. And that is to assume that if we're looking at a reasonably short amount of time and a reasonably large number of bases and a rare mutation process, 
then it's very unlikely that you're going to get the same base mutating more than once. And if you can make that assumption that no base mutates more than once, then you can simplify this process even more. And that is a, an assumption that's generally made by effectively assuming that we're going to take the limit as the number of, and then say that what we really care about is this limit of n lambda uh, as we uh, go in that, uh, to those limits. And let's call this lambda star then we can say that we're accumulating mutations somewhere within this infinite set of bases because it's infinite effectively, you never hit the same base twice. And so what you can do is more or less assume that you simply have a continuous number line here running from base zero to base one, where you can think of this as fractional distance along the genome. So value one would mean at the far end of the genome, value zero, uh, the, the starting end, and then we can simply say that any mutation accumulates at some point sampled by a uniform 0, 1 random variable. So in other words, we can study this mutation process by just saying that we have some arbitrary starting point. We don't really care what the initial strand of DNA is, but as we cycle through our process, we're simply accumulating the set of uniform random numbers that are telling us where the mutations appear uh, or uh, which ones appear in any particular unit of time t. So basically what we can say is that our process becomes sampling our uh, Poisson random variable with parameter lambda star t. That's going to tell us how many bases mutate. And then we can just say for i gets 1, 2, however many bases mutate, take a position that's uniform 0, 1, and just put some mutation at position s. And often when we're simulating a complicated DNA uh, model, this is really what we would actually do. We would just be saying that at any point in time when we look at our strand, we have a set of these positions on the real number axis that correspond to the sites that are mutated. And this is a model that is typically used in the field that is known as the infinite sites model. And often that's what we're going to want to assume we're using when we're studying mutation of a DNA strand. So that, that's the most typical way people would study mutation of a DNA strand. In this case, again, another kind of Markov model, another kind of continuous time Markov model in particular. Right, so any questions about Ooh. that? Okay, so at that point, we have figured out how to go from mutating one base to tracking a whole set of bases in a single lineage. But that's where things kind of get complicated because if you're trying to study more than one lineage, then suddenly you can't use these kinds of models because mutations in different lineages in a related population will be related to one another. So in other words, if instead of one lineage, let's say we had an evolutionary tree where maybe have some sequences mutating this way, other sequences mutating like this. as if it were an independent set of random variables. So the value of this space and this lineage is going to be related to the value of the same base and the other lineages in a complicated way that's difficult to state analytically. These are no longer, we can't think of these as independent random variables the way we could think of this if we were looking at multiple unrelated lineages. So basically the point of this is that we need to do something a little more complicated to figure out how mutation behaves in a set of related organisms. In particular, we have to explicitly model the sets of relationships among these. 
And that's another problem where people actually use variants of this kind of Markov model theory that we've been studying. So in the remaining time, I want to tell you a bit about how that works. And in particular, what we're going to do is derive a kind of model that is commonly used for studying evolution of, uh, or molecular evolution in populations that's known as a coalescent model. And the coalescent model adds some additional uh, assumptions that we need if we're going to derive the, at least the mathematics behind this. They're commonly known collectively as the Wright Fisher neutral model. So these are things that are not exactly true, but are close enough to true, or reasonable enough that we can get away with them, and they simplify the math quite a bit, so we can do the, essentially we can analyze these models and derive some nice properties. So one of the things the Wright-Fisher neutral model proposes is that we can pretend that we have discrete generations. So we're going to assume there is a generation zero, sometimes called the founder generation, and then the children of the founders are generation <coughs> one. So we have a generation two, which is children of the children of the founders, generation three, which is their children, and so forth. We're going to assume random mating. And in fact, for the early versions of the model we'll go through, we're going to assume that we're looking at a haploid, so non-sexual mating, but we're going to assume that any organism's parents are uniformly drawn from the previous generation. We're going to assume there's no selection, and we're going to assume that we have uniformly random mutations. So no mutation is more likely than any other. And as I said, we're initially going to be making some stronger assumptions. These collectively are the right Fisher neutral model. We'll also initially assume that we're looking at haploid organisms, so we're not having recombination among the genome, that these are asexual organisms, and we will initially assume that we are looking at a fixed population size. And what we're going to want to do is see how we can derive a model of evolution in this uh, population. And then at this time, I'll show you how to relax some of those assumptions and get more general models. So what I want to do to show how we would do this is actually first walk through a couple of ways of doing this that aren't really the way you would want to do it, but that help illustrate why we get to the seemingly counterintuitive way you actually end up doing it. And the first thing I want to walk through is to do a kind of straightforward, what's called forward simulation of the populations, which means that we're going to assume that we have some set of N organisms. We're going to assume that we've got a founder generation. We'll just draw these organisms as circles. We've got N of these. And what our task will be, I'll assume, is that we want to simulate their evolution over T generations. And then we want to pick a sample of k of those organisms, where we would assume k is significantly smaller than n. And what we're interested in doing is seeing the DNA bases, or seeing a simulation of them after t generations in the sample of k uh, uh, members of the t generation. So is that clear to everyone? OK, so the way we're going to do this is kind of the straightforward thing you might think. We're going to get our next generation, but n individuals we assume in the next generation, so we're assuming that doesn't change. And then for each of these individuals, we will uniformly at random pick one individual in the previous generation to be the parent. So it might be that this, uh, maybe this individual is the parent to this one. It might be that several in the next generation have the same parent in the previous generation. Might be that some of them aren't parents at all, and, and so forth. Oops, that's not it. Okay, so we now, let's say, have uniformly picked one of the previous generation as a parent for each member of this generation, and then we apply our DNA strand mutation model for one generation along each of these edges. So we pick some 
initial starting DNA strands for each of these individuals. We apply our Poisson model to figure out how to mutate that along this edge, this edge, and this edge, and we get some new strains of DNA in these individuals. We then do the same thing. We do our next generation. We pick our parents for the next generation. So forth. And then we do the same thing. We take the DNA strands from the previous generation, we apply the Poisson model for one generation. Many of these might not mutate, but we get a small number of mutations. And we just keep doing that until we get to the final generation. And then we take our K individuals in the final generation, and that's what we spit out of our simulation. And that's what we would analyze if we want to simulate some DNA of uh, individuals created from this population scenario. So that is a reasonable algorithm for our model. It would give us a simulation of the process we're trying to simulate, but I'm going to assert that that's not a very good way to do this. What's wrong with it? Well, the main thing is that it's really inefficient. So we might be interested in simulating a population of 10,000 individuals for 10,000 generations, maybe even much larger numbers, depending on what you're simulating. We're doing a lot of work in each of these steps. And a lot of that work is actually completely wasted. So if we look at, let's say, the last few generations, we have, let's say, uh, some parents in those generations. We can notice that all the work we did in creating these individuals who weren't part of our population sample is actually wasted work. There was no reason to look at these individuals here because we're not using the sequences we got out of them. And that means that it was actually wasted work to look at the ancestors of those individuals if they weren't also ancestors of these individuals. So in generation T minus 1, we only actually care about the individuals who are the ancestors of the people we looked at in generation T. And in generation T minus 2, we only care about the individuals who are the ancestors of the people we cared about in generation T minus 1. So actually a pretty large fraction of the tree would end up being completely irrelevant to what we were looking at. And that leads to a, an improvement of this process, which is to say that we really are only interested in these K individuals. So let's flip the tree upside down, look at those K, and simulate backwards in time where they came from. And we can do that pretty straightforwardly by saying we have our K individuals. And then what we want to do is figure out did they have K distinct ancestors on the previous generation, or did any of them share an ancestor? Those are really the only things we care about. They had K distinct uh, uh, ancestors, that would be fine, but every so often they're going to share an ancestor, and that's the thing we kind of need to, to watch for. And we can keep running this until eventually we get down to the point that all of our individuals come back to a common ancestor, known as the most recent common ancestor, MRCA. So if we do this, we're keeping track of K individuals in the final generation, at most K in the previous one, at most K in the previous one, and every time we have two individuals sharing an ancestor, then the number of people we need to look at for all subsequent generations goes down by one. So basically what we're doing is watching until those K individuals collapse back to one individual. And we just need to know how often these collapsing events occur. And these collapses are known as coalescence events. So if we take two individuals and we're assuming that they're drawn from a population of N individuals, what is the probability that those two specific individuals would have the same ancestor in the prior generation? It's just 1 over n. 
And the way we could figure that out is to say that this one picks an arbitrary ancestor among the n people in this generation, and then there's a one over n chance this one happens to pick the same ancestor in the previous generation. So the probability of a coalescence is one over n. And so that would tell us that on average we need n generations for any pair of individuals to coalesce. And if we have k individuals in total, then we would have a roughly 1 over n times k choose 2 probability of a coalescence in any given generation. So we could treat this as a kind of geometric process, or uh, basically running using this probability to just ask, is there a coalescence this generation, is there one this generation, and so forth, as long as n was sufficiently large that you don't get multiple coalescences in the same generation, that would give you a pretty good description of your process, and we've got this much more efficient. We're only keeping track of at most k people at a time, instead of looking at all of the individuals. Now we can actually improve on that even more by recognizing that if n is really big, then this becomes a very small probability per generation. So we're looking at a lot of generations with a low probability of change on each one. And we can start to think of it as really a continuous process. Instead of asking which discrete generation do we see a change, we can just ask what is the probability distribution of time until we see a change, thinking of numbers of generations as the, the, a continuous variable. And just as we've seen with various other kinds of probabilities, we can actually show that this will end up being a sort of exponential process. And we can think of that by asking, what is the probability that two individuals coalesce? And we derive that to be 1 over n, which tells us the probability that two given individuals don't coalesce is 1 minus 1 over n in any given generation. And that means the probability they don't coalesce in n times tau generations is just 1 minus 1 over n to the n tau. And this, in the limit as n goes to infinity, 1 minus 1 over n to the n tau is actually limit as n goes to infinity of 1 minus 1 over n to the n, whole thing to the tau. And this is actually an identity for 1 over e. So in the limit, this is 1 over e, or in other words, the whole thing is e to the minus tau. So what that's telling us is that the probability density of times until co or probability distribution of times until coalescences is exponential with rate n tau. And that gives us a way of simulating this even more efficiently, and that is to think of it as a kind of continuous time Markov model. So we simply say that we start out with k lineages and then we can ask what is the time until the first coalescence. That's going to be distributed as an exponential with rate 1 over n k choose 2. So we sample that. We can pick uniformly which of the two that coalesce. We get a coalescence time. We then sample the time until the next coalescence. It's exponential with rate 1 over a k minus 1 choose 2, pick the ones that coalesce then, and so forth. Just keep doing that until you get that down to one individual, and then what you have from these exponentials is the amount of time that elapsed on the edges. We can then use our Poisson mutation model to figure out how many mutations are in each edge, throw them into the tree, and go back from this bottom MRCA forwards in time, dropping mutations on the edges, and get a much more efficient simulation of the uh, distributions of mutations in those different nodes. And that's the full thing known as the coalescence model. So I will mention that usually when we do this, we actually throw out the n, 
just do the exponential k minus 1 choose 2, exponential k choose 2, and just recognize that that's equivalent to multiplying the length of each edge by n. That's a simplification we can use. But this ends up giving a very fast, efficient, simple model for studying population dynamics, where we can think of the overall process as simply a continuous time Markov model, moving from a state k to k minus 1 to k minus 2, and so forth, eventually to 1, with these rates, k choose 2, k minus 1 choose 2, and so forth. And all of our theory for analyzing these models then applies to the coalescent. So there are a lot of extensions of this, a lot of ways you can adapt it to different kinds of systems. So I was hoping to get to some of this today. We're, we're out of time. That's in the notes. is populations with substructures, different groups, and so forth. But I think this hopefully will give you at least a feel for how it is that a lot of this Markov model theory comes into analyzing uh, real systems and population genetics and tools people use all the time for studying that. Are there any last questions before we break? Okay, before everyone leaves, I do have a couple of handouts and some things I wanted to mention. Uh, so first of all, I've got a revised course calendar, if you guys could pass some of these around. So just made some changes based on a, uh, we'll, we'll have a guest lecture uh, coming up, and I'll do the guest of the other lectures based on that. And I'm also handing out 